All right. Um, let's discuss the apology. Um, all right. So we're, we're getting into Plato. Um, so much to be said. Um, Plato, we're going to talk about a bunch of Plato's writings. Um, not only the Apology, but the Gorgias and the Mino and the Republic. So we're, we're spending a considerable amount of time with Plato. Um, one very famous philosopher said that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato. And there's some truth to that, um, particularly when you're starting out in philosophy. Plato really set the foundation for, for Western philosophy. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of, I, I need to go through a little bit of the um, background, I guess. Uh, I got to set the stage, put it that way. Um, one thing that's in, important is that Plato is writing dialogues, which are like little, little plays, uh, stories. He's telling stories. But since he's telling stories, it's really important to know the context uh, because you know, you got to have, if it's a story, you have to know where and when it's taking place. And so that's where I'll start. Um, everything, all of Plato's dialogues take place, place in Athens, Greece, um, which by the way, is still the capital of Greece. It's not like a, <laughs> still exists, Athens. Um, Athens, Greece. Um, and one first thing I want to note about Athens is that it was a democracy. Okay. Um, I would like to go into the Peloponnesian War and how that influenced uh, some of the elements that you find in the Apology, but I think I'm going to pass over that. If you are curious about um, some of the things that are being said in the Apology, like that you don't understand, like, Socrates served in the war. Well, that was the Peloponnesian War. Um, the 40 tyrants, that was the Peloponnesian War. I, 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 I suppose you can just look those up if it matters to you. But the fact that Athens was a democracy is a big deal because it was the first democracy and the only democracy um, in the ancient world. And the only one for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So Athens was the birthplace of democracy. It's the first place, they're the first people that ever came up with the concept of democracy. Um, that said, I probably need to describe what kind of democracy it was because it's not the same as our democracy. We have, we, you know, we're a republic as well and Athens is not. Um, okay, so um, in Athens, um, yes, all Athenians, could vote, Athenians could vote. Um, and but that begs the question, what do you have to do to be an Athenian citizen? Well, um, first you had to be male. Women couldn't vote. Not surprising there, that didn't even happen until the 20th century in most, uh, you know, United States, for instance. Um, so you had to be a male um, and you couldn't be, uh, a slave, and it was a slave economy, which also probably should not surprise you because every place in the entire world at this time was a slave economy um, from, I mean, from Latin America. I mean, in other words, you know, uh, Central um, and South America to China, to every place was a slave economy. So, um, don't let that unsettle you too much. That's just the way it was back then. And there were a lot of slaves. Um, you couldn't be a foreigner. And that's a big deal too, because there's a lot of foreigners living in Athens. It was a trade hub. So it was a place people went to go make money, you know? And they came from all over the, uh, the world at that time. Um, and even other city states in Greece it was divided, Greece was divided into city-states. So even places, other places in Greece were not 
considered Athenian citizens, um, you had to be from that city because every city was a country basically. Okay, so foreigners, and there were tons of foreigners because of, it was a trading hub and lots of people went there to do trade and make money. And so that was a lot of people. Um, however, if your family had been living in Athens for you know generations, I don't know what the exact rules are here, but if your family had been in the city for a considerable amount of time and you maybe own property, I don't know if that was a requirement actually, but um, essentially if you were um, indigenous to the region, to the city, you were a citizen. One thing that didn't matter is whether he had wealth or not. Uh, that's for sure because Socrates was, him, Socrates was notoriously poor and he was a citizen. So I guess it doesn't make it any difference whether you had any money or not, but uh, it just mattered that you had, your family had roots, I guess, to put it, you know, family had roots and, and that's all. Then you were a citizen and everything, everything was voted. So there, it's not a Republic. They did have elected offices and you'll see that people that, um, in some of the dialogues, they refer to elected offices. There had to be people in charge of certain things. They even elected military and uh, naval officers, for instance. They elected them. Um, it was, but, um, but they didn't rep. They didn't rep. They didn't elect representatives like governors or anything like that. Uh, they elected people to do certain tasks, but once, uh, but really everything was voted on by everybody. So, and I mean everything, like, should we go to war? Should we build a wharf? Should we uh, build a wall? Should we, what? everything, everything was voted on by everybody. Um, think of our proposition system in California, that kind of thing. So everything was kind of put in front of, of the citizenry and they had to vote on it. By uh, it wasn't electing someone to represent you. It was everything was voted on by everybody. Generally, like I said, there's there are there were certain offices that uh, they needed people to be in charge of. You know, to to make the place function, they had to have some elected offices. Okay, um, so given that, um, let's talk about sophists versus philosophers. Um, this is also important background here. So there arose, particularly in Athens, it was in Greece generally, but Athens in particular, this group of people called the Sophists. Now the Sophists, the word sophē um, means wise. So Sophist means wise man. So they're wise men. Okay, that's, that's the literal translation of Sophists, wise men. And they were the first paid teachers in the world, well, at least in the Western world. I'm not sure about the Eastern world, but in the Western world, they're the first paid teachers. The interesting thing is what they taught because the sophists, yeah, they taught math and astronomy and some things like the pre-Socratics, you know, talked about and, you know, and conveyed some uh, that, of that kind of knowledge but that wasn't really their focus. That was a minor thing. What the sophists really were interested in teaching was how to persuade, how to win arguments, how to sell yourself, how to cut down your enemies and opponents and uh, disparage them. All these kinds of techniques like that, which is kind of strange, right? It seems weird. That's wise man, and that's what they taught. But pause for a second and you'll and think about it. You, it makes sense, okay? This totally makes sense because how do you get power in a democracy? You can't. You, it's not everywhere else has a king, or and you know everything else was your royal bloodline and all that crap. Here in in Athens, the only way you can get any 
political power is by getting elected to some of those offices I mentioned, or getting what you want um, passed, right? When things are put up to vote, you want to get them passed, so you have to um, argue for those. Um, it's, so in other words, you need to persuade the people to follow you, and you do that by using these techniques. And this is not something that's unfamiliar to us today, because there are a lot of people that still do this. Lawyers, when they go to court, they're trying to win, and they use, these, they use sophist tactics. Advertisers, they use sophist taxi, uh, tactics to sell their products. Um, definitely the political spin people, you know, that you see on TV or, you know, uh, all these people, the talking mouths that try to convince you of their political positions and attack their enemies, which they do, right? Attack ads and stuff. It's the very same, it's the very same things that the sophists were uh, trying to teach people how to do. And rich people would pay these sophists a lot of money. Okay, these, <laughs> this was not a free service. The, the sophists, they would pay the sophists a lot of money to teach their children this so that their children would learn how to get political power. Okay, along comes Socrates. Okay. <clears throat> Socrates looked at these guys and said, what in the hell is going on here? You're supposed to be wise men. What about the truth? What about actual knowledge? All you're teaching people is how to win. Winning is not aimed at the truth. It's not about knowledge at all. What If you're a real wise man, and philosophy means lover of, of wisdom, if you're a real lover of wisdom, you would seek the truth and not be concerned about simply winning everything. You would try to find knowledge and truth. It cannot be understated how much Socrates committed himself to this quest and um, how serious he was about this. Perhaps uh, I'll get into that in a while. Um, okay, so in a way, philosophy grew as a, <laughs> just to put it, <laughs> philosophy is a reaction to lawyers. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. I mean, uh, and things like that. Like, um, philosophy is like, we see, uh, we see these people trying to persuade people to believe things that are not true and philosophers step, stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, the truth is really the thing that's important. All right, um, now, um, okay, again, another thing I need to talk about before I get into the apology is the relationship between Socrates and Plato, which is very uh, complex and confusing. All right, first of all, Socrates is a real person. All right, got, got to get that on the, get out there in the first place. Socrates is a real man. There's no question about it. There's tons of evidence. There's, uh, he's a real guy, okay? There's no, no question about the fact that Socrates is not a made up character, but he never wrote anything down. His student, Plato is his student, um, is, the person that wrote everything down. Um, we have a little, we have little snippets of information about Socrates from other people, but not much. Plato wrote everything down, and Plato wrote his entire life. He wrote dialogues, stories, like I said before, and he makes Socrates the main character in every every story. So Socrates is always always the main character. And Plato is always, always the author. Now, they're stories. You have to understand that these are stories. Plato is not like some guy sitting in the corner writing down uh, uh, 
like a court recorder or something writing down what happened. No, he's, uh, he's not recounting real, real events and real things that happened. He's making up stories. Plato is making all these stories up. But he, when he does that, he puts Socrates as the main character in every one of the stories. How in the world are we supposed to separate out what are Plato's ideas versus what are Socrates' ideas when Socrates didn't write anything down and Plato wrote everything down? And to make matters even more difficult, I, I'm just going to say this flat out. Plato was way, way more brilliant than Socrates. Plato was the genius of the two of them. Uh, so Plato is the real, uh, not that Socrates didn't have anything to contribute. He actually, he, uh, he had some really interesting and insightful ideas and Plato, and Plato built upon them. Um, but when you really get down to uh, the brass tacks, the bottom line of it all, Plato was really the genius of the two men, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm quite convinced, actually. How do you separate out what's Socrates and what's Plato when Plato wrote everything and Socrates is always the character? All right, here's... Uh, Here's how I sort it out, okay? And how I think you should sort it out. Number one, every one of Plato's writings is Plato. He wrote it. It's always from his perspective. It's always him. I mean, he's the guy who wrote it on the paper. It's always, of course, it's gonna be his point of view and his, his thoughts. Um, now that said, um, it is clear that he was very much influenced by his teacher, Socrates. Um, and that is particularly, uh, particularly true in his early writings. So in his, in his early life, I mean, he wrote for long, he wrote for Plato lived quite a while and he wrote a whole ton as you will see. Um, in his early writings, and we know which we know the order of them. And by the way, the way that the, the text that I gave you is set up is in chronological order. Um, in his early writings, we would assume that the young Plato is very much influenced by his master's thoughts and ideas. So maybe that is more Socrates and less Plato. And it's very clear that as his career went on and as he wrote more and more, that his ideas changed. I mean, when we get to the next reading, which is the Gorgias, you can see that Socrates, the Socrates that's being represented in as the main character again in the Gorgias is very, very different from the Socrates in the Apology. Well, why? Well, it was that because Plato is using Socrates to express his ideas at that point, as opposed to the actual Socrates. All right, I hope you get that. That's because that is confusing. Socrates is, is the guy speaking in every dialogue and Plato's the guy writing in every dialogue. So that's a little bit confusing. Okay, so I'm gonna dig into the apology a little bit. It's also called Socrates defense, which is a better translation. The word apologia in Greek means defense. That's why it's called the apology but it's not, uh, he's not apologizing for shit. He's defending himself. So he, I mean, Socrates, this really happened, a real event. He got dragged into court and had to go to trial um, for uh, corrupting the youth, um, worshiping false gods and being an atheist. And this happened when he was about 70 years old. Um, well, when he was 70 years old. Um, and this is an account of his defense at that trial. We do not get to hear the prosecutor's arguments. We only get to hear Socrates' arguments in his defense. Um, the reason I picked this dialogue, um, which is not, it, this is not even much of a dialogue. You'll see when you get to the other readings that there actually are more like dialogues. This is actually more like Socrates just talking. But um, the reason I picked this is because 
this I think represents what this is. This is our attempt to understand Socrates as opposed to Plato, because first of all, it's one of the earliest dialogues. So this is one of the times where Plato was very much influenced by Socrates rather than his own position. And this is a real event. <laughs> it really happened. And um, so again, it's a story and no one would, no one at that time would have thought that uh, Plato was trying to um, write down every word for word what Socrates actually said at the trial, but um, it has to be fairly close because we do have a lot of um, we do have a lot of material from that time, and no one apparently no one says I was at the trial and that's not what happened. And a lot of people were at the trial. There was five hundred jurors and probably a thousand spectators. So this has to be has to be sort of close to what Socrates actually said at his trial. And so now we get, so this is our only kind of real, the closest we're going to get. It's still Plato, like I said, uh, because it's his take on this, but it is the closest we're going to get to understanding the real Socrates and what Socrates actually had to say about things and thought. Um, okay, so as I'm not going to go through every detail of this. There's a lot of interesting things that happened during this, um, this uh, rebuttal, this, this defense of Socrates. But um, I'm going to go through some of the things that Socrates says at the trial. So they assemble 500 jurors, first of all. And then what happens is the prosecutors, and the prosecutors are Miletus, Lycon, and Anitus. Um, those are the three guys that brought the charges up. Anybody could bring charges against anyone. In, <laughs> in ancient Athens, that's the way it worked. Anybody could, you could prosecute your neighbor, whatever. You could, anybody could bring charges against anyone. So these three guys decided to prosecute Socrates. Okay, so they, we don't hear what they say, but then we hear Socrates' defense. Um, now, what he says, first of all, um, is uh, he points out that he's not a sophist and he's not a pre-Socratic. Those are the two things I want to note. Um, one of the first things he says, at probably the first thing, is I'm not going to get up here and parade my children, which he had young children, he's 70, yeah. Um, I'm not going to parade my children and friends to, to say how great a guy I am or whatever. Um, and I'm not going to try to give some flowery speech. Essentially, he's, he's ruling out all the sophist, sophist tactics that I just mentioned. He's not, he's not a sophist, and he's not going to be like a sophist. He's going to talk in his usual way, as he says. He also mentions that he's not a pre-Socratic. Um, and here, this is, he does that in the context of uh, discussing... Uh, the play, there was a, there was a um, guy named Aristophanes who wrote a play about Socrates and made, it was a comedy making fun of him and Socrates was up in the clouds, it was called The Clouds and Socrates up floating on a cloud talking about um, uh, the, sun, the sun is a stone and the moon is made of earth, which I mentioned in the last lecture, that's not him. He's like, I'm not that guy. I don't talk about that stuff. Um, that's all cute and well, but that's not really me. By the way, I just note that, hey, a famous play, this is like having a movie made out of you, <laughs> out of your life. I mean, Socrates was a famous guy. Yeah, uh, one of the leading playwrights at the time wrote a play that everybody went to the play. I mean, this is like having a movie made out of it. Socrates was a famous person, okay? <laughs> like, a, he's a real person and he's a famous person. Um, the other thing I want to mention about that is, it, that is true, and Socrates doesn't talk about the things that pre, the pre-Socratics talked about. I mean, um, they're all, the pre-Socratics are really interesting and I, you know, I like, they're interesting to study. But what Socrates is more concerned with is, and Plato, 
um, is that is human affairs, ethics, politics, human interaction, um, knowledge even. These things are a lot different from the things that the pre-Socratics uh, talked about, and especially in this way. We know a hell of a lot more about atoms than Democritus knew. We know a lot more about the Big Bang Theory and evolution and all the other things that the pre-Socratics talked about. Now, but one thing we don't know much more about is human interaction and the behavior of human beings. Um, I'm sorry. That it's, it may be a shocking revelation to realize that, and by the way, these guys are living in democracy, so when they talk about politics, it's not that different from our politics. They talk about ethics. It's still about, we still have these same ethical issues. They talk about the way that people treat each other and behave and think. Human beings have not changed in 2,000 years. Sorry. If you want to get an F on your paper, begin that paper by saying 2,000 years ago when people were stupid and didn't know anything, Plato said this, because you're not even comprehending the fact that Plato and Socrates, the things they say are as relevant today as they ever were because people haven't changed, which may be very disappointing, but it's totally true. People have not changed that much. And so it's, this is a lot different from pre-Socratic philosophers. All right. <laughs> Went on and on about that a little bit, but <clears throat> all right. One of the things he says also at the beginning is that the jury has already decided. Like I said, he's super famous. Everybody knew him. Um, he's like everybody. You all, you all know me, who I am, and you've already decided whether you like me or not. And this is all going to come down to that. Uh, you're not. In other words, you're not going to listen to anything I'm about to say because you already have made a decision whether I'm guilty or not. Um, you're not going to, you're not going to listen to my defense, really. That is a very important point for Plato. Okay, I will come back to that at the end, but that, not so much for Socrates, but for Plato, that's an extremely important point. Um, all right, so... How does he frame his defense? Uh, one of the main things that he does is he talks about the oracle at Delphi. Um, let me pause for a moment and I'll come back. <clears throat> 